uh, thought we would kick off by quickly just going around the room and people introduce themselves so that people know who's in the room and, uh, and uh, just to get an idea. So, start over. Hi, I'm Kitty Bruderson from Clover's office. We'll need to speak up. Oh. Sorry? I didn't hear. Didn't hear. Oh. You want to tell people who you are? Oh, okay. My name's Catherine Skipper. What else am I meant to say? Where do you come from? Waterloo. Waterloo. There we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This opportunity is. It's an opportunity for council to brief uh, people within uh, residence groups and others that have a, an interest in the site so that you understand the work that has come uh, out of the work that the city uh, has done. And then there's a question that flows from that in terms of uh, what we do with that. The urban growth have extended the amount of time for making comments on their web interface by two weeks. We ask them to give people an opportunity to actually absorb this information um, and to be able to respond. But then there is also the broader question in terms of uh, what other acts, action might, uh, might be possible. So I'll pass over to Andrew to uh, uh, run us through the council stuff and then we'll move to questions and discussion. So my name's Andrew Thomas. I'm the manager of the strategic planning unit. My colleague David here, David Fitzpatrick, also works with me. Our primary role at the city is to develop planning controls um, that support the growth of some of the broader objectives of Sustainable City 2030. In response to a council request, the city commissioned a consultant's report to assess the uh, potential risks and opportunities that might flow from the ATP moving from public hands into private hands. Okay, so um, what we've been able to do tonight is distribute you with an actual copy of the report. Um, the report was authored by a general sort of consulting firm called Hill PDA. And also we've distributed a copy of a PowerPoint presentation that we did to council on the Monday night, the first council meeting of the year. So we could quickly commission this over the Christmas period um, and was able to get this done, I think in a reasonable time frame. And it, it, it's great that um, Urban Growth has extended the opportunity for comments. So really, I think um, David and I are here tonight really, I suppose, to provide you with a quick overview of the report. And these are fairly concise reports, so um, given the time we had and the purpose of the report, you know, there's, there's not a, a great deal of detail here, but I thought tonight could also be an opportunity for you to ask questions. So D David and I aren't going to speak for very long. Um, it was a fairly brief briefing of the councillors on Monday. Um, so... With that, I'll, I'll just get straight into it. So the ATP site, just for, for reference on that, that first slide, given the context of where it is, and I'm, you're, all, you're all in and from around here, so I won't dwell on that. So perhaps moving to this slide, which is the subject of the EOI, the expression of interest. Okay. So um, let's start with the biggest bit. That's all the 
the stuff in yellow is what they offer as part of the expression of interest. And I'll talk a little bit about the process later on. So, um, the, that includes lot 8, 9 and 12, which are the, the vacant lots, the essential, essentially the lots that haven't got a building on them yet. And I think they're being used by and large for car parking and those sort of things. The uh, pink parts are the buildings with long-term tenants. So the EOI identifies them as, yes, they're part of the offer, but there's obligations to honour the, the leases within those current arrangements. <coughs> um, excluded from the offer essentially are the two government buildings on the site, uh, or the, the buildings with government occupiers. That's the, um, uh, they're, they're the blue, the light blue bits in the bottom right hand corner, the RMS and the ambulance, which you're probably aware of. Interesting to note, or one of the concerns for the city council is uh, included in the offer is all of the public domain. Okay. So all the, the, the circulation space and the roads, the footpaths, the connections to Redfern Station are part, are included in the offer. And I think it's probably a good time. Shall I talk to the actual subcommittee? Yeah, the moment. So, in, in 2013, uh, the Crown submitted a, a subdivision uh, application or request to the city to actually subdivide uh, this site into a number of different lots. So up prior to the approval of this in about October 2013, this existed as one large lot. Okay? So uh, what a subdivision essentially does is carve up uh, parcels of land, gives them specific identification or reference numbers, and um, identifies the lots, the parcels that have buildings on them or are vacant, and also identifies lots for, for roads and streets, streets and uh, footpaths. <coughs> um, but in this case, this subdivision uh, has created uh, rights of way or access easements for vehicles and pedestrians uh, as part of this, this subdivision. Okay? So if you look at the ROI, they're essentially selling those parcels. This subdivision gives access rights to the public for both vehicles and, and pedestrians. Sorry, can I just, just pick up on that point because it's one big thing we've found. The Central Park, they're closing them off. Mm. So what happens is, is they... You can talk up loud. Sorry, in Central Park, <coughs> which we always were promised we'd have the right of way, what's actually happening is, is when they subdivided the site in modification number, whatever it was, so they approve the concept plan, redo the concept plan, then many years later they do a modification. They strata the different blocks on the site and include exactly what's happened here, the access easements for vehicles and pedestrians. Now what's happened is, for instance, a road called Park Lane or Park Street or whatever it's bloody called is a normal road that you're supposed to access. They put a lock over it and stop the cars from going down there and now they've got the shits about people even walking down there because that's actually part of a lot. So one of the blocks has its own separate strata body and that has the road. And so those people move in and then they say, we don't want people to be there. And they just take the matter into their own hands. And so my immediate thought is here, exactly the same thing will happen. And that's one of the big <coughs> things, contentious things on Central Park. You may not be aware of because we haven't screamed about it yet. 
Yeah. yeah. And, and I suppose it all goes, it comes down to what the app, you know, what the obligations are as part of this subdivision. But you can change the obligations on the way through, can't you? Well, I'm not too sure the answer to that the question, Jeanette. Community type thought and was successful mm -hmm. getting that as a community title hold with um, strata or whatever. A council's approach. So, for example, if this was a large single lot that had an industrial building on it and we carved it up for residential um, building lots, we would require the roads and footpaths to be dedicated to the council. Yeah. Okay. So we would then assume the title. So we don't have this access arrangement through easements and things like that. There might be some cases, say, the smaller pedestrian links between buildings and things like that where, and, and there's a number in the city, uh, like in the CBD, where we would, we would support a similar sort of arrangement, but we would also be quite specific about the hours that they would be accessible, okay? But this sort of urban renewal context, our approach would be that the streets and the footpaths and the parks be dedicated to the city. So we would obtain the title. So that's not what they've done here. No, but as part of our um, response to this ATP EOI, one of our represent representations would be that they do do that. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> and, and the thing also to note about that, um, that parcel there is actually that green space, yeah. the park. So there's no right of access secured mm. through this. Well, you're absolutely right. They can build on it, and that might just be a, you know, an issue of the technical definition of what a right of carriageway can let you do. Yeah, true. Legally, Jeanette. I was going to say in Central Park, they're building over the footpath now as well. So I'm just saying, I'm just trying to <coughs> demonstrate. I oh, know the land there. That, has you know, there's been changes on. along the way. So whilst the city first worried about it and we first worried about it, the assurance will give them, but they've just modified it and modification of yeah. it, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so you might have the right of way on the footpath, but you've got the building overhang on top, which was actually City of Sydney public land mm -hmm. along Abercrombie yeah, Street. Yeah, and there are a number of examples in the city yeah. and around where we would support an overhang over public domain and we usually charge for the, the privilege. Mm -hmm. to say, I think it's worth just thinking a bit about the history which you uh, got here back in 2013 there was a registration of interest. On that, at that stage the, it was only lots 12, 9 and 8 that were being made available for sale. Yeah. That's yeah. right. So um, really <clears throat> What was in, in place through the registration of interest was asking private parties, or may also be Sydney universities, another example, to uh, think about buying those lots and then developing them. Um, if you look at the actual documentation that goes with the sale, which um, I, I couldn't see with all due respect any commentary on that, but CBRE have put out a document as part of the sale process. Mm -hmm. And they have actually got mock-up diagrams of the buildings that could go on lot 12, lot 9. Yeah. Uh, and the scale is um, significant yeah. in terms of height. It's not, not yeah. ultra so, high, the but the point, the point I want to make yeah, is yeah. that um, the sale process now is about the whole site, which is what was, we understand, demanded by the original parties that took an interest in the ROI process. In other words, they say, don't, don't just give us these lots. If you give us the whole of the site, mm. we'll actually pay you more money. Mm. So I, I think there's quite an improper process on the side of the fair government uh, and lack of transparency in explaining that as to what's actually happened here. Mm. And if we, if we trust that they're going to keep what's now public uh, areas, mm -hmm. um, as, as genuinely public areas for use by the public, we're just uh, kidding ourselves. We know what their intention is because they've actually signalled it back in 2013 as to what they want to do on the site. Well, not perhaps all the detail. What document was that? It's, a, it's the sale document that has been put out by CBRE. It was available. Oh, Frank, 
Sorry? Not Frank has the same sort of stuff in it too. Yeah, sorry, there may be maybe yeah, a range of parties involved in, the, in trying to break or a sale. Yeah, the one but it was available at a recent um, um, session that um, ATP was running. And it's worth looking at because it actually gives sure. you the scale of, of uh, buildings that the proponents are wanting to put on the site. Yeah. And if you then look back through the financial press, uh, it's clear that one of the bidders, Movac, is teaming up with um, Commonwealth Bank as a prospective occupier of one of the buildings. Mm -hmm. That'll probably be on the car park, lot 12. Mm -hmm. uh, Walkers have talk, been um, described as talking to Google about having a building on site. Sure. Um, there's probably a range of other parties that haven't been publicly so signalled. So I think, I think we really need to be clear what's going on here. In terms of what is and what isn't allowed on the site, and then the other thing, which is the risks that the sale present, we do at this point to separate the two. Um, there is actually, not permission, but there are planning controls that do allow additional buildings to be built on the site. So they were put in as part of the Redfern um, Waterloo section of the major development set. And we have to take those as a given. We can't get around those. They, they're there in a piece of um, state planning law. So I, I have a feeling that hopefully those buildings that were shown in the Mount Frank um, material we were talking about reflect what those actual planning controls were. And we'll have a look at that just to make sure that it does. Because we'd be very, very keen to make sure those planning controls. Yeah, no, I'm not making an assertion that they're going to exceed the planning controls. Yes. It's, what they, yeah. it's what they want to do on the side is the issue, mm -hmm. as, a, as, a total, as a totality. Sure, yeah. Although, just, just back on the, on the subdivisions. So that subdivision is now approved by council? Yeah, it was, um, a, crown, it was a crown application, so we we're obliged to approve it. Yeah. Um, and so what happens then if the people that own it decide not to proceed with that? Well, that's a good point because the subdivision hasn't been registered yet. Yep. Oh, okay. So it's still, it's not actually in effect. Mm -hmm. okay. So what we still have is the previous lot arrangement. Yep. I'm not quite sure exactly what that is, but I know that it's not been affected. Will it go through, or is it just the hold-up, or is there a reason why it hasn't gone through? Well, also, it's kind of like a, like a development application, Jeanette. I mean, you don't have to act on it. Right. You can get it, but you don't actually have to do it. Oh, okay. So it's just, it's just holding up the... Or holding your well, I have no hand. idea, to be honest, why they're there. I think there, there's other negotiations going on about um, the width of footpaths in certain areas. That's all I understand. Um, this was happening as the registration of interest yeah. B. Yep. Done. So, if you think about whoever were the powers that be were working on this and having discussions with various people prior to the close of the re registration of interest, and this was happening in parallel. Yeah, and you know, there's. It's there for an option because someone. That's right. Yeah. Someone might have said, "Well, we only want that that lot or that opportunity." So, to have it as a subdivision in place that then could allow that to happen, it, it's yeah, kind of a, it makes sense yeah. if it suits their purposes, yeah. you know, so, all right. So what's the scale of buildings that are on there at the moment? Sorry? What's the scale of they're indicating? We're talking about I, I the ones that are permitted that haven't been built on the, the site. Well, so in, the, in a sale brochure as opposed to... Oh, okay. You got it. No, I mean, basically, the sale is supposed to happen around the... 2005 controls. Yes. Yeah, but when pushed, um, urban growth about well, you all obviously look at your increased densities along the site. So therefore, um, you know what will happen as far as this part of the site. Urban growth seem to be keeping up, open their options. That the time they get to finalise this, they'll have a better idea of what's possible, and therefore they will, might be able to capture uplift in terms of improved price. So I think the question of while they're saying they're selling it on the 2005 controls, there is the option to be able to say, oh, well, we are going to allow an increased uh, <coughs> density and therefore extract more money. And that's the bit where I think it becomes this conflict of interest between the government as landowner and trying to get the best. That's an inherent conflict. And the media already had high creep. Um, 
a very sad to the long way in the show. Sure. And the other one, I think, lot nine, is hot. The current controls that be by in the media city anyway. The there are around the around eight, frank documentation. It's about eight to ten stories, I think, was the control that I think it's eleven. But these ones here have on the yeah, I think yeah. this one gets a letter. might have a letter that's so far. And we have quite a few here. Mm. Um, and it's lower down the thing, the wheel sure. thing. Anyway, that is what the purpose is. And then just to, you know, the, the, I suppose the response we get from Urban Growth about this EOI is that yes, the planning controls are attached. I suppose what concerns the city is that as we move from a public ownership to a private ownership, it opens up, in, in spite of the EOI or part, as part of the EOI, someone can put forward a non-conforming tender or yeah. bid or response, which would offer more value and therefore really get, get a favourable consideration, even though it sits outside. Now, that, that could come through a, you know, Unsolicited That's the right, the right, uh, <laughs> the right term. So, oh, we love that word, in, don't we? In now? a sense, that that risk exists anyway, and um, I suppose what we can find our comments to is the current process that's in train, and the risks and the opportunities that are created by that. Um, and just, can I just ask on that? Given that the report today from Newcastle, that one of the big recommendations is the is the conflict of interest picking up on this, mm -hmm. is that relative then to this? Because we're sending our comments back to urban growth. I mean, I just feel like I'm going round and round in circles. Well, I suppose it's... And that's one of the recommendations, is yeah. that they break that conflict of interest, that you can't have that in the process. Does it mean anything, that inquiry report? The, the Newcastle one? Yeah, because, I mean, you can apply that across the state. Mm. You know? I mean, it talks about urban growth again and again and again, mm. the conflict of interest the government has. Mm. Well, it's inherent in the Barangaroo development. Yes. Um, in, in so many decisions where mm. the, the, the government is, is effectively the proponent or the beneficiary of any mm. money value that's created, um, I um, that's... I can't really comment I mean, anymore there's, that. There's, there's a conflict of interest there. You should, I think, consider also going to the Minister, but the Minister has exactly the same conflict of interest. That's right. Effectively They're sitting point. in Cabinet where they make the decision. <laughs> so just to, to talk a little bit more about um, uh, the controls and, and I suppose the future development potential that exists in the current controls, We've talked about buildings, in spite of the, the glossy document, I think up to 10 and 11 storeys. Um, there's currently about 100,000 square metres of floor space already occupied and operating on the site. The existing control, controls allow for about another 100,000. So that's already built into the existing controls. There's a, a use restriction on here so that it doesn't permit uh, residential uses. It's for commercial uses and, and jobs, which by and large the city would support, um, given its location and the relative, I suppose, um, lack of specifically zoned employment land that's sort of close enough, but not in the heart of the city so that it's so expensive. You know, so by holding the uses or restricting the uses, you're also holding back the value a little bit in our in, in, in our, the work that we've done on, on, on other parts of the city. So that's something that's very important for us going forward um, is keeping the employment focus. And it was the the intention of the ATP, the Constitution. It was all about attracting a new industries and providing jobs for, for locals and, and the surrounding community to really support the, the jobs or provide opportunities from the jobs that were displaced as the rail yards and all, all of those older industrial uses moved out in the way. So Andrew, one of the things in the um, glossy document is the possibility of building a hotel on the site. 
Does that fit in with the commercial use? Well, it's, uh, or is that actually a separate zoning as well? Um, well, it'd be a use, and I'm, and I'm just not exactly sure of what the zoning table says for this site, but it's considered a non-residential use. Mm. So, I suppose the question is how... Um, the zoning precludes residential accommodation. Yeah. And allows all other business yeah. uses. So, so tourist and visitor... I imagine a hotel and a conference facility. Yes. So yeah, tourist and visitor accommodation is a different definition, at least in the Sydney's in the city's planning controls. What about student accommodation? How's that considered these days? No, that'll be residential accommodation. Will it be residential? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And you know, it's hotels. Just so on the hotels are a little. There's a there's an undersupply yeah, of demand. those in, in Sydney, and we'd be looking at opportunities that would support hotels. No, if I can just say, I, I think the work that's been done is great. That's not, not an issue, but you're really saying the city would have no issue with any type of commercial building of any type at the end of the day? Um, our, our current position would be that we support the general approach of the controls that, as they exist in the, in the 2005 plan put in place by the government. So it's about the original mission. That's right. Yeah. Went back to the Better Cities program. Yep, that's right. And the Brian Howe in the early 90s. The living heritage that's there sure. as well. It's not museuming or setting it up as an exhibition. It's, it's, it's a living, active um, park. And, and it's public access is absolutely critical to that. A lot of the heritage fabric um, <coughs> machinery is located inside the buildings. Um, you know, from that subdivision pattern, there's no secured right of access inside those buildings, so that's that's another shortcoming as well. Question on the um, lease of the Tax Pen Base for Rod Artworks at the Australian Technology Park. Oh, yeah. So, um, of course. My position was that I'm terribly concerned that when our licence runs out in five years, yes, under a public ownership, it won't have, um, there won't be any renewal, and that's when the heritage, active heritage of the site will be able to be changed into another use. I don't think it's going to be, and that is one of the risks as well that we see, and it's going to be an important part of. How do we try to secure those uses for a long term future? Yes. I mean, clearly, <coughs> public ownership, the last time that particular lease went up, there was the ability to apply pressure because it's a public body, it's a government, it's susceptible to things like voters. But um, I agree, there'll be much more. Yeah, and the hotel has sort of been earmarked for, you know, on the site directly opposite the workshop, too. Mm -hmm. so that will have a, you know, an effect as well on them wanting to renew it. But they wouldn't anyway because it's not a commercial you know, rental, it can't be. So there's no way a commercially minded private owner will support the heritage, active heritage on the site. Absolutely no way. And there's nothing really in place that he, he will have to. So the perpetuity of the workshop um, is, is something very limited now. Well, maybe, maybe there's an opportunity, I'm not too sure if we, we go into it in any detail, similar to um, processes that we have in place to secure um, affordable housing, and, and there's a, a, a criteria and a, and a formula or an assessment criteria to determine essentially a rent for, for the affordable housing, and it's generally at about sort of 30 to 25 percent less than the market and there's a, a bottom in place to actually assess that.